Again, my name is Dave Taft, and I will be talking a little bit about some interesting things on Long Island. But driving out here, you know, I love bumper stickers, and I was looking at bumper stickers on the way out here, and I, it occurred to me, there's one, the, the end. And I was thinking, I was just going to say, welcome from the other, other end. Long Island also has the West End, and in Brooklyn, where I hail from generally, and in Queens, where I manage the park uh, for the National Park Service. Some of you may know the Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge and some of the other sites around there. Um, you know, underneath all the hipsters and all the new developments and everything else, if you scrape just under the surface, it's the same glacial moraine you'd have somewhere out here in Suffolk County. And it's always worth a reminder that that's the case for all of us out on the island. A lot of the issues are the same. A lot of the materials that we find ourselves looking at are the same. In either case, today, I'm hoping to talk to you a little bit about my topic, Hide and Seek on Long Island. Saprophytes, parasites, mycoheterotrophs, and mixotrophs in our local woodlands. It's a mouthful. I bet you thought you were just going to play Hide and Seek on Long Island, looking at my title. Now, plants never get any credit, but they are just beautiful, and the adaptations are truly remarkable. Now, this is going to be, you know, that Monty Python line, and now for something completely different. Not very like the last two presentations, but I'm hoping that there's still a place for this kind of wildlife and wild plant observation skills and interests uh, in a group calling themselves the Long Island Naturalist Organization. Because there's a great deal of things to look at in the field. We're just entering into the spring season. And when John Turner talked to me uh, about this great presentation about parasitic plants at Lino, I said, oh, I can't wait to find out who he got for this. This is going to be great. <laughs> Here I am doing the parasitic plants of Long Island. Um, those of you who know me know that I really, really love orchids, and particularly the natives. And we'll be talking a little bit about them also. But the whole subject of what exactly are saprophytes, parasites, microheterotrophs, mixotrophs. There's a whole world of plant things to discover and discuss. We're very blessed on Long Island. I mean, the eastern end of Long Island, that much of it still looks like this. It's fairly well preserved. We've got to be pretty careful because there's a lot of development here. I like to think on the west end, most of the arguments have been settled about what you do with a beautiful woodland. Um, an open wetland. Unfortunately, that's not necessarily the case, but out here you've got quite a bit more of it, and it's worth looking at. They are stunning. Having come from Brooklyn to Long Island, I can only tell you, don't lose it. It's much harder to get it back again. But plants are stunning, and they are incredibly deceptive, because who doesn't like to look at a beautiful pink flower, an orchid, blue-eyed grass, any number of things that are so beautifully adapted, but also just plain pretty. They're also pretty devious, though. A lot of them have very specific adaptations that allow for making a living, being pollinated, any number of things that are required just to get by as a plant on Long Island or anywhere. Besides the pretty things, though, there's also some pretty bizarre things that we might be talking about. And today's subject is really about those kind of odd things you might find in the woods. How many people like to get out, take a walk around every now and again? I also crunch numbers all day long, do the budgets, and all the rest of those things for a large organization called the National Park Service. Uh, but it is very nice and very refreshing to get out. And I'm hoping that there's still enough in the audience that would like to hear about some of those plants as we go. So now, forgive me as I get all high school biology on you for just a couple of seconds, because I would really like to talk about some of the things that are terminologies that will make our lives easier as we talk about plants, and maybe some surprises for you about some of the plants that are here on Long Island and how they make their living. We all learned about autotrophs when we were growing up. An autotroph is an organism capable of synthesizing its own food from inorganic substances using light or chemical energy, green plants, algae, and certain bacteria are autotrophs. So the sensitive fern in the background there is a good example of how green an autotroph is, mostly for the chlorophyll in it. Saprotrophs, any organism, especially a fungus or bacterium, that lives and feeds on dead organic matter, also called the saprobe or saprobiont. One thing I can say about um, these is that it's no longer considered that plants can do this themselves. It's generally accepted now that plants are in partnership with fungal elements, like the amanita here, 
uh, that would allow them to absorb the nutrients from decaying material. Plants don't do that themselves. A heterotroph, an organism that cannot manufacture its own food and instead obtains its food and energy by taking in organic substances. That would include most fungi and bacteria. And for example, the eastern tent caterpillar, my daughter when she's cooperative, and, for example, some plants that are interesting because if you notice anything about this plant, it's the very fact that there's an, a lick of photosynthetic material in this plant. And we'll be talking about the corpse flower or Indian pipe in just a couple of minutes. There's another category of plants that I thought was important for us to discuss when we talk about Long Island plants uh, in particular, and that is a group called mixotrophs. Or partial heterotrophs, if you want to be a little bit more scientific. I just like the name mixotroph. It sounds really hip. A mixotroph is an organism that can use a mix of different sources, energy and carbon, instead of having a single trophic mode on the continuum from complete autotrophy to on one end to heterotrophy on the other, which means that at various points, either seasonally or over the course of its development, or protect, potentially at any point in its life, it can go from being completely dependent on fungus, potentially, to being completely autotrophic, photosynthesizing itself. So plants like, for example, these sundews that we'll be talking about are what we call mixotrophs. And orchids, all of them, are mixotrophs of some sort or another. Some actually, though, are much more dependent on fungus than others. And we'll be talking about them in just a couple of moments. I promise there won't be a lot of graphs, and there won't be a lot of numbers, and no one's going to be grilled afterwards. But just to go through this, there are a number of ways that this system works. And a few of them are pretty interesting when you really get down to brass tacks. Arbuscular mycorrhiza, it's a symbiotic relationship. Now, when I was growing up, I thought symbiosis just meant a favorable relationship, which is now called mutualism. Symbiosis now these days is just a combination, a, a partnership of some sort, whether it's good, bad, or other, it seems, in the literature. So it's a symbiotic relationship between plants and members of the ancient phylum of uh, a fungi called glomeromycota. These days, and I'm not a mycologist, it seems like it's kind of a catch-all place for mushrooms that don't go elsewhere, but generally gilled mushrooms with white spores. Uh, it improves the uh, supply of water and nutrients, such as phosphate and nitrogen, we all know that part of it, that in fact, the mushroom, the fungus, whatever it might be, is actually supplying the plant with materials it has been able to absorb from the soils. These nutrients are then transported to the plant. We'll talk a little bit about that um, in a minute. Um, and the plant, in a mutualistic relationship, will actually transport carbon, fixed carbon, and other photosynthetic materials to the fungus. So it actually is mutual in the sense that both benefit. In the case of these arbuscular mycorrhizae, and there's a number of varieties of this as well, the arbuscles are what make it really particular. Those are inside the cell of the plant root. This is a root hair. Another form of this is ectomycorrhizal fungi. Now these critters actually don't penetrate the cell. They basically go in between the cortical cells and the epidermis of the, of the root hair. And you can see what's going on there. They put together something called a hardic net from the researcher who discovered that back in the 1890s. One other particular thing about this form of um, mycorrhizae is the mantle, which densely covers the outside of the root hair. And so some plants and their symbionts are working in this regard. Now, in some ways, it's hard to tell what plant would actually have which one of these um, forms of mycorrhizal arrangement because they're still being studied. This is one thing that I can say in doing the research, particularly for this talk, it's interesting to note that there's a lot that's not known about them yet. One further kind of arrangement that's fairly significant for Long Island, because we have, do have a lot of ericoid plants um, out here, that is cranberries, blueberries, um, many of them. Even, for example, the 
uh, corpse flower we just saw before, um, though it doesn't use this arrangement, they're ericoid uh, plants, and they have a sort of a combination of the two mycorrhizal arrangements we just discussed. So in this case, in blueberries, cranberries, other ericoid plants, fungal coils form inside the epidermal cells of the um, root hairs of the plant. So in other words, in a blueberry, the outside layer of those root hairs will be covered in coils inside and a loose set of hyphae, not like the mantle from the, uh, the other set that we were talking about, but in there, that arrangement will allow the change in, or the exchange of nutrients as it goes from there. So the coil site is where the fungi exchange nutrients obtained from the soil of carbohydrates fixed through photosynthesis by the plant. And that's what it looks like. Inside each of those cells are the hyphae of that plant, which will then exchange nutrients. Cranberries, pretty familiar. And of course, in just a couple of weeks, probably not even, well, it's supposed to snow tonight or tomorrow night, so maybe a little bit longer. Uh, but we all know Epi Epigia, the uh, Mayflower. And I found this kind of cute diagram on the internet as I was looking around. It's a little wrong in a couple of places. You probably know which ones, for example. In this one, for example, well, let me go back a little bit here. You've got the fungi benefiting from the tree's carbon dioxide and carbon products, but in fact, it's the other way around too. In that case, in many cases, you've got fungi providing nutrients back into the tree. But it's true that the detritus comes out into the fungi, the fungi connect to the plants that are in the woods or in the field or wherever it might be. The interesting thing about this, though, is that, again, if we substitute a couple of things for this, for example, let's just take the average green plant out of this picture and insert this Cypripedium orchid, the arrows would be a little bit different. Now, this is a mycoheterotroph, but a facultative mycoheterotroph, which means that it's not always using the materials from the fungus, not through its entire life. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later on in the, in the talk. So the arrows would be at various points in its life history as a seedling or as an adult flowering plant, quite different. The same for the Indian pipes. In this case, it is truly a mycoheterotrophic uh, arrangement. In other words, this plant parasitizes the fungus. What's interesting is no one's quite sure why the fungus grows into the roots to begin with. If it offers some reward, if it's somehow um, deceptive that the fungus doesn't realize it's not getting any reward for making this arrangement with the corpse plant. But it is parasitic in that arrangement. All this to say that a walk through the woods is kind of an interesting place. Plants never get the credit for what they deserve. So there's a lot of things going on in the woods. And I know when I was growing up, I never suspected how literal the idea of a food web really was. These plants and funguses are all connected, literally, under the surface of the soils, uh, maybe through bark, through rotting wood, and the rest of that from trees to mayflowers to fungal elements in the soil to rotting logs. Uh, all of this has a very specific connection. So let's just talk a little bit about some of the plants that we're talking about in this uh, presentation now. Indian pipes, or corpse flowers, are mycoheterotrophs and obligate mycoheterotrophs, which means that they have no other choice. There is no photosynthetic material in this plant, as you can see. The most color they might have is this one on the upper left that has a slightly pinkish cast. There are times you'll find a red one or two every now and again. The plant's very short. Most of you are familiar with it. It's considered quite rare in places, but Long Island, as you probably know, how many have seen this plant in the woods as they've walked? Of course, there's just many of them. They can grow in large colonies or individuals poking up. Um, it is on the west end. We rarely get it poking up at the Jamaica Bay Wildlife Refuge occasionally. But a plant, again, which occurs and flowers. This is a flower on this plant, reproducing, not a mushroom. That's one of their biggest questions, is it a mushroom that we have? But it's one of those plants that, in fact, 
you find fairly often in, in the uh, sites um, as you walk through the woods. It is an Ericaceae, which is one of the plants that we were talking about, though this one does not have the same arrangement that we talked about, the ericoid mycorrhizal arrangements. This one does not use that, more an ecto. We've all seen it, the arrangement of hanging flowers when they come down, um, in the, when they first develop, is most likely a way of protecting pollen and allowing it not to get wet if it was facing up. <clears throat> if it was facing upward, you'd have uh, water getting into it and probably affecting its pollination. And so it hangs down until the very moment when it becomes pollinated, and we've seen those as well. That means the plant is ready to produce its seeds, capsules are up, and essentially it dries out in place. So what it does is as the capsule dries, that's the fruiting body, dries out, seeds spread from there, from the highest point it can be at. Closely related, pine sap, Monotropa hippopithus. Now, hippopithus means under pines in Latin. And I don't generally see this under pines. Occasionally it will wind up over there. But it's, I think, a point made that it requires or doesn't require a great deal of sunlight to grow. This is, again, an obligate mycoheterotroph. There is no photosynthetic material in here. So the plant literally gets all of its needs from its fungal host. So what may be happening is the fungus being in a mutualistic arrangement with trees nearby, very often beech in the case of this plant, uh, then transports literally some of the materials the beech has synthesized through photosynthesis into this plant, and that can be tracked. Um, they have been tracking this through various radioactive components so that they can find this in the, in the pine sap afterwards, after it's been tracked through the beech, through the fungus, and into this plant. Now, interestingly enough, there's some debate about this plant being one or two species. Frequently, I see the yellow variety here um, on Long Island and upstate as well. But there is another variety there's some discussion about, the red or hairy pine sap. How many people have seen the red variety? Locally, where I am these days around Dix Hills, um, there's one colony I've been trying to find again for four years now. There was an enormous flush bloom of this plant that made the woods look bloody. Literally hundreds and hundreds of colonies of this all through the woods. I've never seen it again uh, in four years now. This year will be the fifth. I'm not sure how seasonal what that is about. Uh, I can say there are colonies of this up in Westchester you can see every year. They come up not nearly as dense as that one was. What happened in the soil, I can only guess at. Perhaps that some fungal element was doing especially well that year, and this plant benefited from that arrangement. But it basically was a one-time affair. As I said, I've never been able to find it again. Um, I'm sure it's there. And it leads us to question some things that we think we know about dormancy and about what we think is, go is going on outside of that. Um, at other points. So some people have put this in a separate group, Hippopitus lanuginosa. It's very debated. Um, I know Connecticut Botanical prefers to separate them out. Long Island Botanical is not right now. Uh, but there is some discussion of that for New York Flora Association. It's an interesting thing. This red variety flowers much later. It's uh, flowering usually in late August, September, even into October. Is always far hairier than the yellow variety. And the yellow variety usually flowers in July or early August. Now here's a surprise. Um, I had always assumed that bear corn, um, American squaw root, or Canophilus americana, was another of these plants that relied on fungus. It is not. Apparently, this is a plant which is strictly parasitic, and parasitic on oak. Um, essentially, when you're walking through oak woods where this plant is, and on Long Island, I can only say I've seen it perhaps in Shoe Swamp and in areas on the North Shore, the soils are a little bit richer. Um, it grows these kind of knobs where the hostoria, which is the stem that feeds from the fungal element into the host, the tree in this case, and basically raises these large lumps. So if you see these plants in the woods, if you examine the surface roots of the oaks nearby, frequently you'll find these larger lumps on them. And they are probably the evidence of this plant and its actions in the woods. 
Very interesting. Squirrel corn, as I say, is probably a plant that prefers richer soils than, than we find generally on Long Island. Another very common plant, beech drops. We've all seen beech drops in the woods. It's an annual that comes up. And it's interesting to, to note that it does vary in color quite a lot. This is an alvinistic one that I found one day walking around. Um, and there are the flowers without any pigmentation at all. You do find this typical form more often. But this is an annual parasite as well which is kind of an interesting thing. You've got to have a pretty secure source of food if you're going to be an annual parasite. Because ultimately, each season, you're going to have to find that host again. The plant does not require um, any kind of arrangement from funguses or any other sorts of uh, plants nearby for it to survive. And you can see in some areas, particularly I know, um, Generally speaking, in more disturbed areas, I find much more of this plant. I'm not sure if I'm just making a correlation that doesn't exist. But in my field time, it does seem to me places like Staten Island, where woods are very trampled, frequently these beech trees are very heavily infested. All the literature I could find suggests that this is not a very taxing parasite on, um, on beech. But it is interesting. It's specific to beech trees. One flowered cancer root. Now, this is a weird one, and it's got some really unfortunate names. Um, anyone seen this plant in there, wanderings around? Um, this is a small plant. It grows no bigger than eight or nine inches, generally speaking. I have only seen it in Queens, which I'm quite sure there's better habitats in Nassau and Suffolk County. So if anyone has seen it, I'd be curious to know. But this is very closely, at first, you might even pass it thinking, oh, another corpse flower, Indian pipe. But it is a flowering plant, very, very different. It's actually closely related to the bear corn we just talked about, the canophilus. And I think that when you see these, they come and go. This is also an annual. Uh, the plant is a parasite of sedums and goldenrods, uh, asters, when they were asters. Now they're something else. Uh, but the facts are that the plant comes up pretty much on an early spring basis and shows up very lovely. The western varieties of this are bright, bright blue. Ours, I've never seen anything but white or pale pink. Uh, but quite lovely. Or a banshee in a flora. Um, another plant that we would pass by normally. If you go past a wet field and really poke around, you may find one or two of them. Again, not common, but I do see them in queens occasionally. And absolutely... Um, a parasite. Now we've all seen dodder. Dodder is a very strange plant with a lot of varieties. Now there is one very endangered dodder in New York State that's found in the Pine Barrens, which is the smartweed dodder. Uh, there are several colonies of it. Two of them were lost, two were found. There are probably more of them. It's one of those plants that people aren't excited to see because they basically there are a lot of invasive ones, and there are plants that really suffer for the daughter. Things like uh, field clovers, uh, chrysanthemums, tomatoes. There are plants that really wind up with daughter. But the adaptations this plant have, has are pretty, pretty remarkable. Um, the plant starts, it's an annual, the plant starts with a seed in the soil and grows a typical root and a vine. They're related to morning glories and vine weeds. And they climb up a stem. But the theory is that based on volatile compounds in the air, the plant will orient itself toward the preferred host plant that it might find. It needs to find this host within two or three days, which in plant terms is pretty damn quick. Um, if it doesn't find it, basically it just perishes. And that's the end of that seed. If it does find the plant, and you can imagine that the odds of finding you know, their preferred um, prey, as you might say, um, are Fair to middling, they might find it, they might not. But once it does find it, it's a pretty nasty plant. I've seen this myself. It wraps around the stems, and the Historia, again, the plants, the parasites, stem that penetrates the plant itself. And in this case, it's the stems, not the roots, but the stems of the plant, literally push their way into the stems and absorb nutrients and water directly from the, from the source that's the, the host plant. Now, in the case of this, um, once it gets established, the 
bottom, the root of the plant completely disappears. Now, I don't know how many people have seen dotter in the wild. Um, sometimes you'll find 10 yard square messes of dotter, like somebody dumped orange spaghetti across a, you know, some sort of a field. In any case, it does flower. It does have quite beautiful flowers. And the fruits come in about late summer, and they're spread through it. There's more literature out there about how to get rid of daughter than to actually examine it or figure out which daughter you actually have, because there are quite a few varieties of it, native and non. Now, getting to some of the other plants that we talked about. Now, they're not really parasites, but with the title Hide and Seek on Long Island, I thought maybe we should talk about some of the plants that are what we call mixotrophs. And they're not always involving parasitic relationships with fungus. The roots of sundews are actually quite minimal. They're really only used to anchor the plant and maybe some absorption of water, which isn't really a problem depending on where the plant is growing. Generally speaking, uh, sundews are found in very wet environments and swamps, bogs. Uh, I'm sure people are familiar with it. It's a beautiful, beautiful plant. Uh, there are a few varieties that we can find on Long Island. Um, the round leaf sundew, spatulate leaf, and thread leaf sundews are all found on the east end of Long Island. And very interesting, I really did not realize this, but the thread leaf sundew, of all the ones that look likely to be able to wrap itself around insect prey, unfortunately, that's the one that can't do that. It's a plant that does not have the ability, it's called thigmotactic ability. Thigmotactism is where the plant can wrap itself around prey. Now, in plant terms, four or five minutes is lightning fast. For an animal, not so much. But it is kind of interesting to watch these things. The glandular hairs on filiformis, which is what we're looking at right now, are flexible and will move into wrap around an insect that's been ensnared. But I remember one day uh, actually looking for orchids. And you can see the calipogon over there that's with it. It was a hot, hot day. And I always wondered, now, what would cause an insect to land on a bed of sticky mucilaginous material? Doesn't seem very inviting. But as I was walking, the sun hit this patch of sundew in just the right way. And it suddenly dawned on me that if I was looking for a drink of water and I was a dragonfly, it's pretty darn inviting. Whatever the case is, they are very successful at catching their insects. And thank heavens they exist in those habitats, because Lord knows the mosquitoes can be very, very dense. And fireflies and any other thing. I've actually seen things like dragonflies completely ensnared in a colony of Drosa filiformis. Rotundiflora the, and the rotundifolia and uh, the spatulate leaf actually do wrap their tentacles around these insects and actually surround them. And then glands dissolve the plant. There's a slurry that sort of comes out of it that the plant absorbs directly through its leaves. Again, the roots are not particularly effective. Interestingly enough, too, with, with uh, sundews, if you're walking through them and you happen to break off stems and leaves, which is pretty inevitable as you're walking through and hiking through some of the habitats they're in, um, you need not worry too much because the actual stems will reroot. The leaves can reroot. Um, it's pretty well adapted to living in very unstable environments, so it's very capable of supporting itself. Pitcher plant, another one that we can talk about in terms of its mycoheterotrophs. It does have some arrangements with root funguses, but for the most part, its partnership is really, or its mixotrophism actually, is based on its being able to absorb nutrients from water. Um, now, I've read that this plant is terribly ineffective in capturing insects, actually. I think someone did an estimate is that 1 or 2% of insects that wind their way in there are actually captured, which you wouldn't think was very successful. So being nosy like I am, I used to stick my finger into that little bucket there and see, well, what is in there? By the end of the season, this plant isn't having any trouble collecting its insects. It's doing pretty well. Um, there's lots of stuff in the bottom. And interestingly, the young pitchers, they last about two or three years. The young pitchers produce a tremendous amount of exudate. They basically produce all kinds of material in there to digest all kinds of insects. By the time the second year comes around, it has an entire ecology living in that pool of water, which does most of the work. Water does come into that, which dilutes those compounds it's producing itself to digest the plant, uh, the materials that fall in. But it is also 
reliant on all kinds of rotifers and things like that that are living in there that will literally just dissolve the uh, insect carcasses that fall in. I've actually seen frogs in them, living frogs in them, um, peepers, spray tree frogs. I'm not actually sure if they're able to survive to get out. Um, you'll notice the downward pointing hairs that everyone always talks about um, as a way of preventing things from getting out. I would imagine even a tree frog might have trouble escaping from that, but it also would be perfectly happy to live in there eating the insects that fell in. So I'm not actually sure how that would work. A friend of mine has a theory that the plant itself, and this is, again, not documented in any way that I know of, looks like some sort of an ear of a mammal, some sort of a deer or something like that, the venation in it, and it may attract insects based on wanting, like a mosquito to fly over and try to get a free blood meal. Again, it's a theory. It's possible. I haven't read it anywhere else, though. There is a whole world of information that would be interesting to get into, maybe on a presentation of its own, about um, utricularia. Uh, that's the bladder warts. This is the horn bladder wart, fairly common on eastern Long Island. There are a lot of bladder warts out there. And this is a plant whose engineering is so sophisticated that it grows a bladder and sucks insect in within a 50th of a second uh, when they trigger hairs and things. It's very beautiful. Flowers are very frequently seen. The plants usually are in very, very wet areas, or they're submerged in water. Um, there isn't time enough in a presentation like this to get into the world of utricularia. But it is a very interesting thing. There are some people who really specialize in finding them out in the wilds. But any of the ponds in the Pine Barrens, generally speaking in summer, will have these flowers sticking up mysteriously. If you don't know the plant well, you've got to move um, quickly to see them because you really have to get close. It's sort of a belly plant. Now, I'm getting the cue that I have to speed it up, so I have a whole world of orchids to discuss with you. And I thought I had this down to 35 minutes, but apparently not. Um, all orchids are mycoheterotrophs. In order to develop from seeds into protocorms, they require a fungal partner to provide nutrients. Orchids are very strange. They do not have cotyledons. There's no material in them to grow from. And so this strange thing turns out from a seed. It's a protocorm. Some of our most spectacular plants um, are the orchids found on Long Island, Calipogon, uh, Pogonia, uh, the pink lady slipper, Cypripedia macaulay. But I did want to talk about one that's MIA. This is the small world Pogonia, only recently seen again in New York State after an absence of about 100 years. One of the last records of it is not more than 10 minutes from where I live in Dix Hills. Um, I've looked, I've looked, I've looked forever. Can't find it. But the thing about this plant is it's known to be dormant for dozens of years at a time. 15, 20 years. That's a lot of looking for a plant in an area you may not know where exactly it is. It's really quite a special plant in that sense, but it really makes you redefine what exactly is dormancy. Nothing I know living could survive 20 years underground without some assistance. And this plant is famous for its arrangements with mycorrhizal elements. This plant probably maintains a good deal of its um, attachments to the fungal materials, the hyphae, that invaded the seed when it first developed. The same is true for all of them. Long Island is blessed with some very odd orchids. For example, this is Platanthera ciliaris, the orange fringe or yellow fringed orchid, found in only one colony in all of New York State on Long Island. Isotria metalloides, um, close relative, Isotria verticillata, is found in numbers out here that friends of mine dream of seeing. Um, I have a friend in Maine who just can't wait to come down to see this thing. It's an open invitation. And Tipularia discolor we'll talk about in just a second. But another group of orchids that I wanted to talk about briefly before I run out of time is the coral root orchids. These are plants that are obligate micro, mycoheterotrophs, which means that they require the presence of a fungal element to allow them to grow to adulthood and flower. They do not have roots. It's a small little rhizome underground. Uh, they have no photosynthesis. So they require this invasion of fungal elements, which they call orchid mycorrhizae. But as it turns out, there's a lot of different kinds of this orchid mycorrhizae, which is like a magical brand. The best thing I could tell you is I found this. And I'll read this to you. It was a study. 
Hypothesis one, that particular orchid species will associate with different fungi when growing in different habitats is supported by our results. This is true of mycorrhizae. Uh, another hypothesis that neighboring orchids in, of different species will share the same fungus is strongly contradicted by these results. In total, our results provide the strongest evidence to date for specificity in orchid mycorrhizae because one neighbors never shared the same fungus. Four co-occurring orchid species had no symbionts in common over a wide geographic range, and fungi associated with an orchid were related to each other, but not to fungi from other orchids. If you follow, basically what it's saying is that these plants are very specific about which mycorrhizae they use and which ones they incorporate, but that probably varies over the course of its lifetime, from seed to adult to flowering, and probably in other ways. I'm getting my cue. So let me just flip through this really quickly. Corallariza odontoriza, Corallariza maculata, which has not been seen on Long Island for about a dozen years, but probably still exists. Antipularia, which I just want to show you as a winter active plant. The only colony in New York State, again, out here on Long Island. And I'll leave it there with an example of how variable that plant is. The purple can be on top, variegated leaves, spotted leaves, clear leaves, or white spotted leaves are all found in one single colony. In any case, I just wanted to conclude a little earlier than I might have. I thought I had that down. That's the tipularia flower. These plants are quite interesting and worth your while. If I can just say that, you know, flip through to the end of this so I can show you the slides. When you're walking through the woods and looking at things as you might, Keep in mind, this is a neck of the woods that I go to pretty often, looking for plants. It could be Long Island. It's really not. It's Long Island, Brooklyn, Long Island. Uh, but keep that in mind. And as you're going through it, remember that these things are more connected than you might actually consider um, in your initial looks through the habitats out there. Uh, plants in spring are beautiful. Go out, see them, report them. Not to everyone, especially if you find orchids, but people do want to know where they are every now and again, and you probably want to keep records for yourself and for others eventually. Thanks.